You're listening to The Golf Stream, the official podcast of the Heart Research Institute for Golf of Mexico Studies at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. Uh, welcome to the Gulfstream podcast. This is our second season, and wow, are we really kicking it off in celebration of Shark Week? And of course, that's a really big week for us here around the Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies and the work we've done on Shark Week. And so it's a really busy time for us. Uh, for those of you that are just tuning in or maybe your first time listeners, I'm Greg Stuns. I'm the new executive director of the Heart Research Institute at Texas A&M Corpus Christi and uh, sometimes host of the Gulfstream podcast. And so we've got a great lineup for you this year in our second season coming up, and, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And But do we have really a great guest uh, here today, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And our, our guest, I'll let him introduce himself in just a minute. But it's a cinema, cinema photographer, Joe Romero, and we've been working together for years on various um, shark weeks and other things, and it's just been a lot of fun. And so we thought he'd be just a great guest to come on and talk about some of our history and then what he has going on and the future of sharks and all that kind of thing. And so I've been just very fortunate to spend a lot of time with Joe on and and in the water. And uh, he's no stranger to Shark Week and all things sharks. And he's really behind some of these amazing shots that you see on TV. And as we all know, many people never get to interact with these charismatic creatures and Joe's just right up front with them. And yes, it's it's all real. And he is just inches from these animals. And in fact, from personal experience with him, sometimes uh, too close, <laughs> having to push the camera in the jaws of these animals to keep from getting bit kind of thing when things don't go as, as far as um, the way you might th- think or the way you plan. But anyway, a little bit uh, about Joe. So uh, first and foremost, he's a naturalist and he really cares about conservation of wildlife in general, but particularly sharks and other marine species. And he, he really practiced what he's preaching. And I can really speak firsthand about that, of interacting with him and watching all the good work he does and bringing all this science that we create into everyone's living rooms. It's just a, a really great team. Uh, he is award-winning cinematographer. He's won all kind of awards. I'll list a few, but too many to list them all. And uh, he's also has his own production company. He's executive director of 3-3 Productions, he can tell us about. Uh, he's also a member of the Explorers Club, which is no no small bar to get into that group. You have to done some you have to have done some really interesting, cool things to belong to that group. But really, probably what's most important is that he inspires conservation of these majestic creatures that we all love and are such great ambassadors for the ocean. And we can utilize them as we bring them into the living rooms of of people. We can convey a really great message about why we care about healthy oceans. And and Joe's critical to to doing that. And so some of these awards that I was talking about, I mean, it's it's things like the, the, the best underwater video of the year, the best in cinema photography, and just host of everyone, so host of many, many others that, that he's won. And so uh, with that, Joe, uh, thank you for uh, spending some time with us on the Gulf Stream. And, and uh, this is a great way for us to get to see each other again. And I was hoping maybe we just catch up on some old times and new times. And so anyway, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your career, how you got into this and what are you do- up to these days? That was like such a nice introduction, Greg. Yeah. Thanks so yeah. much, man. Sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, most of the stuff that we do is like, you know, we work film projects usually with sharks. My wife's working on her PhD studies. So she's like working with star- sharks primarily up here in New England and endotherms, including mako sharks, poor beagles, whites, you know, all, all the well out of the five. We only had like four. But um, yeah, the one that we worked together was was the mako shark. And uh yeah, we have like quite a few stories from all that stuff back in the day. That was like, honestly, I was tr- I was talking about that like just recently and how much that like really took to get done. Because like at that time, like Shark Week was primarily like doing a lot of like great whites and like there were a lot of like reenacting stories and people telling like the tales of things that had happened with sharks. But it was sort of risky to go out there and do like different species at that point because nobody really had so much luck with it. And I remember the first time we even went to Texas, we spent there like maybe like a week and a half and we couldn't get a break in weather. I don't know if you remember yeah. that. And we had, oh, to yeah. like, we had to like come back here and then regroup and then we went back out and then we got like really good luck. And then after that, they started feeling like a lot of faith with, with different species. But we were the first ever like just straight Mako show. And yeah. that, that was like yeah. a big deal. But those were like... Well, 
they just increasingly got bigger as the series went on. So it's like, I think they kind of tuned into the really like big Makos, but those were some, you know, still to this day, those are still some of the biggest Makos that I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was pretty incredible. And, you know, we were talking to them about, yeah, well, we get Makos on a regular basis, but of course it's in the springtime out in Texas where, you know, if you have 20 knot winds, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> you know, it was that's not so windy weather. kind of thing. But yeah. anyway, we ended up catching it just right and got some pretty incredible stuff thanks to you and all the other teams that were out there. So that was a lot of fun. A hundred miles offshore. And I remember like us sitting inside of that. We had that like really nice boat that that local that local guy that owned like these huge yachts and stuff yeah. could help the crew get out there so his boat was super fast and i remember you're running out there in a little center console and <laughs> we were going 100 yeah. miles offshore like at five o'clock in the morning in horrible weather and just hoping for like you know on a wing and a prayer we'd like get these sharks and it was just it, it i mean some crazy stories for sure. Yeah. For sure. It was fun. I mean, it was the fog and coming back in dark and the fog and it just flooded and logs and everything. But we, anyway, we all made it safe and that kind of thing. So we had we made it happen. one of the first sharks I remember that you tagged and we were like swimming. I was swimming after the boat and I, I yelled to the producer if he could slow down the boat because I, I hadn't seen the shark yet. And the boat was traveling too fast and it was just you guys were getting away from me and no matter how fast i could swim even with the current i couldn't keep up with you guys so i was just like maybe you should slow down the boat so i can like catch up to you guys and he's like oh no that's not the boat that's the shark pulling the boat (laughs) away from you and then i remember hearing you talking to matt and you said that's the biggest maker we've ever seen and all of a sudden, I hadn't seen it yet, and I was already in the water. Yeah. I think that was like the biggest lesson I had learned. It was like, see the shark first, then get in. Because <laughs> yeah. it was like these big makers we were working with. At that time, who was really doing them? Like, not too many. You know, it was like, we'd get yeah. prepared, we'd get in. And as far as, you know, a film shoot goes versus, you know, a shark dive, it was like two different things. And we were trying to calculate this brand new species and... I remember the film team looked at me and they were like, okay, we're ready. And I just jumped in and yeah. hadn't yeah. seen it yet. And when we did see it, it was like angry <laughs> that you guys yeah. had, had caught it. Yeah. And I think the first thing it saw was me. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit of abuse, but you guys were really good at keeping them like, you know, to you. And we got some amazing yeah. stuff. I mean, you got to see what that shark was doing and all the things we we figured out at that time, but you guys have done many, many Makos since. Oh yeah, many, many. And of course you remember the, the Shark Eye camera was one of the very first, you know, we were, Huge. that was groundbreaking stuff that you all were doing and trying to put a camera on the dorsal fin of a shark was kind of unheard of. Now, of course, the technology Everywhere. moves so fast, you just clamp them on and you're done with it. But we are having to, you know, fight that that thing from scratch and it was huge it looked like it was a dive tanks on the back of the shark or something but that anyway it, it was really all exist. a lot of fun. nobody really knew how to like you know we were trying to put things together but things were so primitive back then and you were trying to like yeah. i mean and it wasn't even that long ago it was yeah. less than 10 yeah. years ago but it's just cameras well, that, have jumped yeah. so fast that it's now to the point they've got like 360 cameras now on sharks you know well, I know it. I mean, that's just, you know, it's just like science as well. The technology we had at our hands now is just so incredible that to think we can do these things or put a camera on a shark and then we can relocate it and that sort of thing. But I think, you know, to, to tell all our listeners who you save the day in that show, because if you remember the very first thing, you're like, oh, well, this stuff is too complicated. Let's just clamp a couple GoPros on there we with made, a little clamp yeah. device you had and it worked work perfect and to make it like whoop. actually work because we were like yeah. having such difficulties getting all gathering all the systems together but i mean the yeah. shot the shots yeah. worked together and it did work it was yeah. it was funny like at the end of the day like what small things you can kind of like you know put together to make something work but that's a lot of those kind of shoots it's like it's so difficult to be on the field and have none of that really practiced that and you're just thinking in your head like all all this equipment's going to work the way that we want it to we did it with with tiger sharks and we built we built our own this time and they increasingly got smaller and smaller as you know we built them and when we did the tiger shark one i I kept remembering the mako shark and how difficult that was and what we had learned from that but 
during that time that had I, I think it pushed the technology pretty far though like we we definitely learned a lot about how cameras work and with those types of sharks and how long they could work and we try yeah. to extend out things for the battery life and everything else but yeah and mo what most don't realize joe that when you tag you put a camera on a shark like that well that's great you know first step is getting the camera to work and oh, of course getting the animal and getting it on but then you got to get the camera back you know i know you need the footage <laughs> that was the worst so we thing. spent a, we spent a lot of time you know floating in the ocean looking for these tag they had satellite tags but they weren't perfect the and so you still had to go relocate them and anyway it turns out we were successful and got a lot of good footage and that so, kind of thing some of the coolest stuff that i mean at that time no one had ever seen anything from those positions of sharks at all and when, yeah. when we first had made like our first like test one and we tested out in the bahamas we had a fishing line attached to it so that when it would the shark would swim outside the range we could just pull it off because we, oh, yeah. <laughs> we had no really way and then we started figuring out like it was probably better to have like the the tag so that we could find it and we were using gps tags but then GPS tags are only, the technology is only certain amount for fine tuning and finding a spot. So then we had to use acoustic tags. So before you know it, these things had like multiple tags, velocimeters, yeah. all kinds of different things they started putting onto them. And the camera's just getting smaller and smaller to the point where it was just like this little, nowadays you see those and that, that guy Nico out of like Germany has like really good, like really nice systems, those cat systems he put together. And that's yeah. where you see a lot of now is like, that's the dominant yeah. system. But exactly. And well, of course, that's what we're experimenting with now. And that's sort of the state of the technology. But back then that didn't exist. You, didn't know? Exist. So you just sort of had to make it yourself. And, and anyway, and you all did a great job with that. And so I know some of our listeners, uh, and, and I'll tell the story if you don't hear in a minute, are, are always wondering, you know, well, what's it really like? And is this footage real? You know, and how are you getting these sharks, which are essentially, you know, bumping into your camera uh, at the time? And I was hoping you could share a little bit about that. And, you know, what, what do you all do to get those kind of shots? And what's it really like? And what does it really take to, to produce those kind of images and videos that y'all collect? I mean, the one thing, like... As far as like the technology goes, I think that's really what drives like the shots is really like how advanced the technology could get. At one point in time when we had like Blue Water White Death, and for the listeners who don't know what Blue Water White Death is, like the first ever documentary on the Great White Shark, where like Peter Gimbel, Stan Waterman, all these people who inspired Jaws, and some of them who actually worked on Jaws, were the people that filmed the first ever documentary on the Great White Shark. And back then it was like... And it's amazing how good it looks. Like we still watch it every year. And it's like yeah. this, yeah, it looks, they used to put like film cameras in these big canisters and figure out and like Rodney, uh, like not Rodney Fox, Ron Taylor used to put like hot glue around like the seal and push them together to make these cameras sort of work. And it's gotten to the point where that was that technology for a long period of time. Like James Cameron and all those guys were like using ROVs, but mostly underwater cameras were people holding them and yeah it there was a point where that golden age where we were right there were like when they started doing with other different species where that camera started changing and the technology started getting to the point where gopros and other things were like starting to come out and the sports camera generation started yeah and then that took on a whole new light that like eventually evolved into 360 cameras ROV technology now is to the point where it's like consumer based. When I first started shooting, guys were shooting from helicopters. Now they're in drones. It comes down yeah. to a point now that one guy can basically with a few different camera systems that are pretty small can like encompass maybe like six people's jobs. Like you used to need a guy that would just pilot a helicopter another guy to film through the helicopter yeah plan all your shots out of what you would really need and get that done and that wasn't too far along and then they started with the, the drones and that sort of disappeared where now you don't you, everything's drone based we know yeah. because when we shot that mako show in texas we lost quite a few of them <laughs> yeah in fact that was the beginning of kind of some of the drone stuff and getting those shots you know just of simple things like the boat running or whatever, you know, that was all just kind of coming on the scene back then. So I remember anyway. there was one that fell in the water and one of the guys there on the shoot was like, if you see that drone coming by you and it's about to hit the water, you, <laughs> you, you catch it. 
you do what you can to yeah. catch that drone because we need that stuff. And I, I, I was like, yeah, I, I, I don't know about that. I don't know if I'm going to do that. <laughs> so then like we were, I think like a year passed and we were on a different shoot, same guy there. And he shows up and he's got his hand all bandaged. And I'm not going to say his name and stuff, not to give it away, but his hand was all bandaged. <laughs> and I go, what happened? And he goes, oh, I tried to catch a drone. And it was, it was just like, you see, you can't do that, man. Like, you, you can't, you, like, they weren't built to, like, be caught by hand like that. I mean, nowadays, people are really skilled. Like, there's a lot of guys out there that yeah. are amazing yeah. at them. But back then, it was like, these were these wild tools that the gimbals were funky. I mean, yeah. I say back then, but this was, like, less than 10 years ago. Yeah. This was like, yeah. right now, camera technology is, so, like, we used to have these vr systems remember like the first ones we sort of shot like we shot some stuff for uh opposing networks but we shot this big vr sequence with tiger sharks at like a like a moonlit sort of stuff and it was like eight different cameras facing all different ways and nowadays oh, yeah. Yeah. it's like something that's like this big yeah gets yeah so entire thing yeah i know it's it's pretty amazing and nowadays the drones just do whatever you tell them, and they'll fly pre-prescribed routes, come right back to whoever is holding the screen. <laughs> but basically, but that's a long-winded little... answer, yeah, for, for yeah. being like, it's the technology driving a ton of those sort of shots, like making yeah. it able to put cameras in sharks' faces. and right. I mean, there are times where you're still there with the camera system in the cage, you know, or outside yeah. the cage where sharks yeah. like biting onto the front of the camera. But it's definitely yeah. gotten to the point now where we can we – can, encompass almost all angles and it's really hard to come back to the same sort of subject and find new things in it every single yeah. year yeah well they're still using the shot you know you had where the mako pretty much crunched down on, oh, yeah. on your expensive camera i don't know if you remember the story you probably tell it more than me but we i was in the boat watching all this and we had been uh filming a shark that was around and you were getting a lot of footage of it just really close i mean inches from you kind of thing and but it, you you didn't realize another mako had shown up in the meantime you know? and for those that don't know when the makos come in they're real aggressive they're just biting anything we chum pretty much non-stop to bring these sharks in and joe was in the water pretty much in the chum stream you know filming the shark getting all this cool footage and then a fresh one showed up behind him and i think you maybe you can tell it better joe you barely got the well this camera in his mouth you know? they're so like they're, they're different than other f sharks and i heard like a lot of guys that do a lot of time on the water describe them as like more like fish minded as far as like shark minded because you see I mean, we've worked with tropical sharks before. You see a lot of different sharks. They come up, they bump things. They kind of really investigate it with that whole pad and the ampullae of Lorenzini against something. They really want to make sure what it is. Investigating things like with your mouth and everything is costly. But for some reason, these sharks don't do any of that. And they come at you like full mouth open and touch you with their teeth like to see what it is. And it's not really like super hard bites but for people who have never seen it the initial like uninitiated to that sort of stuff the shark comes up and just like opens its mouth like right in your face and then just starts like gently <laughs> tapping at the front of your camera and you know, all you can hear is that glass just like you know scratching and <laughs> yeah. screaking and then every so often they'll give it a real like a real crunching bite to see what that is i i had one that was maybe about like two or three years before we had done that, that, that special that was, I still remember here in New England that was biting onto my cameras so much that it actually got to the point where I was like, guys, we might want to like throw a rope to me to like pull me back on. <laughs> every, every time I would try to make it to the boat, this shark was tuned in to make sure that whatever we were pulling to the boat, because I'm sure that at one point in time, someone had caught a fish in front of the shark and it had figured out if I can get in between the boat and the fish, I can steal the fish. It wasn't a hundred percent sure yeah. that I was not a fish. And at that time I had done a lot of like what we would kind of like move our fins at the surface and make a lot of splashing erratic noises to attract the shark, to get it, to come up to us, to see what we were, because usually it was so hard to get them to come up and investigate anything with us. But this one was so bold immediately came up and then it was hard to cool it down it really wanted to see what i was wasn't sure what i was but was making sure that i wasn't going to make it back to the boat every single time we were going back so every time i'd swim to the boat 
it would swim in between and try to block me. I mean, I'm 100% certain it didn't know what I was. It just saw like a black thing moving around in the water because my wetsuit's all black and my fins splashing. And at that time, I think it just was so tuned in to thinking this must be something these guys just caught yeah. that it was trying to figure out what I was. But every, this was different. It came up and it would do its investigating bites. And then all of a sudden those bites started developing into really hard bites. And it was like the point where you would, I remember looking in the dome and seeing little white bits of teeth inside, like rolling around the bottom of the, the, the lens because of oh, yeah. it biting on the glass. The glass was destroyed. And side note, $5,000 lens that is sitting in the front of this thing, all glass, like eight pieces of glass. The guy who manufactures this is fighting with the guy that makes it, all this stuff. It took forever to get this thing fixed. But it was my real, you know, you have lenses like, you know, that get scratched before, but they'd be acrylic. We polish them out. Glass, yeah. you, you can't polish out. The quality is amazing. Yeah. And you want to use glass as you can. But as a pro, it's like it's so costly when a shark bites it. And it's gotten to the point now where it's like I'm at like I, I think like 20 something. Last time I kind of was like 21 and I've had a few since then where it's just. Yeah. You can't really do much about it, man. I mean, you know about like lost yeah. gear. You guys have probably lost like oh, yeah. really hard yeah. to lose stuff. But it's watching. Well, you it got being, the <laughs> yeah. you got the shot, and it's kind of the cost of doing business sometimes. But <laughs> the I guess most of the the listeners here probably don't don't realize. You know, you're in the water in this case with one of the the fastest swimming fish in the ocean, and you're no no cage. No, you know, you're just right there. Um, and, and you're holding a camera with your hands, which is, you know, inches from the, the business end of that shark. But I guess you, you over time, you all figure out when you mentioned earlier about, you know, the shark's really hot or you can cool them down a little bit to learn so they can learn that, hey, you're not a threat. You know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, about how do you handle yourself when this animal could really bite you in half if it decided to. You know? Well, there's all kinds of different positions that we kind of like, we, we it, it, at first it was kind of like an unspoken thing, but between like a lot of guys who film and really do a lot of shark diving, there is posturing and positions you can put yourself in with a shark to really kind of, it, it reads it better with the animal. Like, you know, with elephants, they'll be like, stand your ground, all that stuff. Like sharks, everybody's always saying, like, keep eye contact. You really want the shark to know that you're looking at it is really yeah. the, 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 the one big thing. The second thing is with these sort of surface sharks, where you are is really an important position to them. Like if you're floating at the surface, you're at a position really vulnerable to them. They can come up and they can check. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, and they can check on like if they see you at the surface, they can come up, they can kind of poke around, check and see what that thing is. But you're at a real vulnerable position to it. You have nowhere to go. You have to yeah. like escape the water somehow. That's why a lot of fish are corralled near shore and stuff. But if you put yourself at different levels in the water, what we call a power position, which is just below the We did actually a show called Laws of Jaws. Uh, like it was part two on that one where the, we had this diver that was really skilled with us and he actually passed on a few years ago outside the point, but um, not from sharks. But he, uh, he would dive down below to show the posturing to it, that dominant position to it, that power position of these sharks. And these sharks don't like to be vulnerable to anything else. So as these big sharks would approach, you can kind of like dive underneath them. They sort of recess. Um, if you're at the surface and you're standing still, they're still cautious because they don't really know what you're about, what you're going to do. So if you can keep like looking at them, they're very, very cautious about approaching you. They want to check you out when you're not looking at them. And then yeah. you can do things to get them closer, which I don't advise, which is a lot of splashing and hitting your fins at the surface and kind of like trailing your surface at the surface, kind of like... You, you know what it's like when a fish gets to the surface and it's like dying and it's it's going through its its throws it's doing certain actions to it that you can mimic and if you start to mimic that the shark recognizes that that's not something i would advise anybody to do but it's sort of a behavior you start to recognize with 
like anything. If you saw a dog, you'd know how to, if you knew dogs liked a certain type of tree and you could emulate how you were, you know, how, like yeah. whatever kind of thing that it made it comfortable, it, it would kind of like want to come over and check that out. And if you're the only thing there, they want to see what that is. You try to like, you know, do different positions with your body. So it's really, I don't want to call it like, it's not like a dance or anything, but it's, it, it, it's definitely like this sort of like body displays back and forth to show like what, what you're about. Like if you're defensive and looking at it and it's coming up to you, it's way more cautious. If you're, yeah. it's coming up to you and you're starting to freak out and run away from it, it's going to know that somehow things that run away are things that know what it is. Right. <laughs> so it's already telling it that this may be something it wants to eat right. or see. So kind of tr triggering those predatory instincts. Exactly. Sort of. Like if you show up and the shark shows up and you start chasing this thing around and trying to grab it, a lot of times this thing goes like, well, I don't know what that's, that thing's trying to eat me. So it just, it, it, there is certain sort of dominance things and things you can do with sharks. I mean, nothing I would advise to people, but there's definitely stuff that shark divers that have a lot of time in the water know to, you know, utilize towards their advantage yeah. to get certain shots because they're very difficult to trust you. Yeah, well, and then speaking of, you know, you all had done all the white shark stuff and that had been kind of done on Shark Week and other shows. And then so this Mako series that we were all involved with was kind of really new about, well, here's a new species, very similar to the white shark, but also very different, very, you know, evolved in terms of speed and power and that sort of thing. But I think you are probably one of the most uh, experienced person on the planet in terms of Makos. Of course, out in the Northeast where you're from, you had been interacting with them quite a bit. And so I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're doing out there with, with your business and taking people out to really experience these kind of things. But sadly, Joe, you know, since we did those shows, Makos have, have not really done so well population wise. You know, they're one of the few that are pretty good to eat and they're of pretty high value to long line fleets and others. And so their chance of recovery is pretty grim, probably less than 50% in the next 30 or 40 years. And some projections are even worse. So, you know, some of those early shows about getting the message about a conser conservation of these species, um, hopefully folks will uh, begin to listen to that because uh, the Makos are, are in pretty bad trouble. Fortunately, here in the Gulf, they're still fairly robust. But what we all learned is those sharks move from the Gulf. Some of our sharks end up in your neck of the woods, up off in New England, some down in the Caribbean. So obviously how we manage fish in one area, especially with these high, highly migratory species, are very relevant to other areas that may not have as good of management in place. And so I was hoping maybe you can tell us about what kind of things are y'all doing out there to bring that awareness out in the Northeast. Well, the big thing we, I mean, what we used, like even started doing back then was we were doing a lot of stuff as far as bringing attention to them. Cause even a lot of people don't really even could make, could tell the difference between a Mako or a great white or really a lot of different species. A lot of the stuff they had seen mm -hmm. on, Television was white sharks, tiger sharks, few other species, but like, well, like we were talking about, it's very hard to be predictable. And what we started moving into as far as like putting camera technology on sharks, going to places where we knew it was really difficult to get to, and then eventually moving on to nighttime, where we were doing nighttime with Makos, which even to this day... You know, you still see people kind of feeling a little bit like because there was <laughs> nobody we had known stepping into those fronts with sharks. A lot of times, a lot of times you're going into areas where, you know, there's predecessors that have done that before and had, you know, dive with sharks, seen sharks, film sharks, been with all different types of species. Makos were one of those that who did we really know? There was like a handful of guys, maybe one or two that had dived with them. And I remember I was talking to one guy who had like one of the probably one of the most intense interactions with a Mako on one of those golf platforms. And I asked him and I was like, how was it? And he was like, they'll just kill you, man. And it was like, <laughs> yeah. I, I learned that that wasn't the case, like through behavior of looking at them. They're a really intimidating shark. But to hear that and not know before you even got to the point. And then we were we were getting the point where we started really kind of understanding the behavior and what kind of like, lang like I want to say language they would speak, but we start to get to the point where we wanted to see what was that at night, which we did a special on. And that did 
Very well. That stuff went to actually the movie theaters. That was like all over the place, the special we did with Makos at night. And yeah. a lot of that behavior now, we right now my wife and I are working on Makos, we're working on white sharks, but we're working a lot with like poor beagle sharks. And poor beagle sharks yeah. have gotten a, they got kind of like a goofy name, but they're actually super, super cool, man. They're like, you know, like really, really cold areas, these really, really thick sort of like baby white shark looking sharks. They're just very Mako-esque, you know, like they're very yeah. interested in things. But it, it's amazing how these sort of like off offshore species act with things because they're even now they're still not used to seeing people. But luckily, yeah. you were just talking about them being endangered too. I wanted to kind of hit on that. Um, they did become super popular. A lot of the stuff like stuff that we were even doing made helped make them really popular. I remember Shark Week was actually when the first stuffed animal Mako started coming out that Shark Week was making. And at yeah. that point, I remember looking at that and going, like, where have we ever seen a stuffed animal Mako? <laughs> like there was they, they really well, kind of iconized that animal and it was such a huge platform for that shark that shark became so super popular and it, I, I mean in all different aspects right now i saw there was a film that came out that was like a full-on hollywood movie that i just saw on one of the streaming networks called mako about like yeah. the mako yeah. shark and that new one that just came out that they're advertising on like the like on Netflix and stuff, the one under Paris and stuff, that one's about a Mako shark. And it's yeah, like so all they're... the all these different ones that started being like really Mako heavy, but it, it it became one of those sharks that became so iconic that actually on the East Coast they actually started to protect it. So in some ways they have to become really popular for people to know these animals are even there. And then I still have faith that I feel like they're going to do very well, but it's going to take, you know, years and people still bringing them up and doing things like what we did. And yeah, yeah. Well, they're they're you know now they're they're off limits to retention in the recreational fishery and the commercial fishery. If they're alive at haul back, they're supposed to be released. But you know, on the high seas, that can it's hard. Yeah, be a little difficult if that really happens or not. But there's such a big uh, bycatch species in the swordfish longline fleet that that's where a lot of them are are uh, captured. But luckily, they're you know in the Atlantic, they're they're doing pretty good, especially in the Gulf. So hopefully, that's a, a bright spot. But we certainly have some work to do. You know, we've been seeing a very high abundance of sharks in the Gulf. In fact, to where it's becoming problematic with all types of user conflicts and that kind of thing. So. In a way, we look at that as, well, that's a good problem to have because most people never realize what a healthy ocean with a lot of sharks look like, looks like because in our that, generations that hasn't existed. I, I, I hear that so. described all the time, the healthy oceans, the balance. Everybody always goes yeah. like that. They're always like, oh, sharks keep balance. They never really explain to people. They're like, well, they, they, they get the sick, the dying, the dead. The best example I ever saw that was up here in New England where people... They, we have great whites that follow along like Cape Cod and they're all along those seals and everything. And everybody's like, oh, the, the seals are de demolishing the fish and the white sharks are here, but there's not enough white sharks to, to battle the seals. <clears throat> what they, we actually see is that the areas that there are no sharks, the smaller species like dogfish and other things will take advantage of like fry and big schools of little fish to a point where they can decimate them. But having these yeah. big sharks, like almost like police or an authority sort of figure being around in the area where these great whites are, we don't see those predators demolishing those fish schools the way we do in other areas where they don't have those predators. And that's one of the things that yeah. people don't get, like that just because those great whites are there, the small, like the stripers, the blue fish, the, the, the fish that we want to catch later get a chance to grow up because all these other smaller species like dogfish, octopus, squid that eat those like those small fish that don't get a chance to grow up. The white shark and all these other like the mako and everything sort of kind of patrol those areas and keep them healthy. And I think yeah. that was the best description I ever kind of got as to, you know, like why they are important like if you remove the the white sharks from the cape i believe like all those fish schools we see up and down the shoal they'd be just demolished all the predators yeah, around yeah. there it would just 
knock them right out. In fact, we have a scientific phenomenon or explanation of that. It happens on the land too, as well as in the waters that you, you release all that predation pressure from those smaller predators and then they do exactly what you're, yeah. what you're saying. So having those big ones keeping those intermediate predators in check, we call it cascading effects in marine ecosystems. And so we've shown it over and over again that you, you need those big predators, exactly what you're saying, kind of policing, <laughs> keeping those uh, intermediate predators in check so they don't get too out of balance. Because so anyway, yeah. We've seen uh, fish populations here change. Like, I mean, there were things when I was a kid that weren't as abundant as they are now because of the sharks being around. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, my wife knows what all of this, like you, like what you're saying, knows all these sort of yeah. like terms and everything. Yeah. I, like, Sciencey, but, egg-headed stuff. But that yeah. was just the one thing that clicked into me because I hear people describe it all the time. They keep balance and they keep balance. And it's like, well, how, you know, you can say they eat the dead, mm -hmm. the dying. And it's like, but how does that keep balance? And it's like, they kind of keep other things from messing with the small guys. And it's like, yeah. and, that, and that's like a big way of describing it where you know, yeah. a lot of these species, yeah, that the pressure, what do they call it? They call it predatory pressure on. Yeah, that... pred pre apex predator, predatory pressures, but they keep, it's called top down control where the top predators control everything below them, essentially. So, so you know, the, and, when you say yeah. you need them, that's what I always kind of picture is that like, you know, you have a healthy fish yeah. population because you have a healthy yeah. shark population. So all those species of sharks where they see hundreds of them in the Gulf and stuff, you got to think like, what are they eating? It has to be making yeah. it healthier for that to sustain that oh, much, yeah. that amount yeah. of life, you know? Well, of course, commercial and recreational anglers don't like it because they're really in their fish and they're they're getting captured. Or shrimpers, they're they're you know biting through their nets and they're losing their catch, for example. But it's simply that you know, in a way, I I preach that well, that's a good problem to have because that's what a healthy ocean looks like. You yeah, know, and we just have to sort of learn to live live with it because that's that's what we want to see in terms of a, a healthy uh, population where like you're saying the more desirable species have a better chance when you have these pred it's got to be about so. scope but there has to be like history where they look at that and go you know this is what was in the past and what is now yeah and it's yeah, going to take exactly. a while for us to get to the point where we were like that but even in like white sharks here in New England, you see a real difference from what I would assume white, sh like it, it seems like when you see white sharks all over the world and right here in New England, it could be because they're like hunting here and there's seals and it could be like a certain time. I, I mean, I've definitely learned that sharks act differently different times of years and at, at, at different stages of their life. But it seemed like, a tremendous amount of the population here was very, very shy of people. Even, you know, you get close to them, they, they sink down to the bottom, they really avoid people. Where in other areas where they're not so used to people, you see them be a little bit bolder. And it really felt like they had extracted those bold animals out of the gene pool. And what was left was yeah. like the meek inherited the earth. And even yeah. to this point now, we have a good population of, well, a rebounding population of great whites. I can't say it's good yet because we don't know what good is, but a rebounding population of great white sharks to the point where they are starting to see some of the animals be a little bit bolder and go check out boats and do certain things like that. But that was like unheard of 10 years ago when these things were yeah. sort of coming back. And it's, you got to think there's something to it. Like Steve Irwin used to say like dwarfisms and dwarfism and crocodiles because they used to knock out the, the bigger species. But yeah. there has to be something to that DNA of extracting the bold animals out of an area from hunting them where all you're left with are these these animals that their DNA and their, everything inside of them says to be like wary of people and to be afraid and to be like more of like cautious and you see that with deer populations, you know, like areas like Florida and Southern California, you see like deer, you can go up like in Florida they, in the Keys, you can go up to them and pet them. Yeah. And yeah. like wild deer are so That's used right. to people. But here in New England, it, it's like if they smell you, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah. yeah. It, it's well, different. Figured that out. Well, yeah. And, and, and you know, we uh, here in the Gulf, there's the population is getting so big, you know, it's it's some pretty negative conflicts that are going on. But anyway, we're, we're kind of living with it. That's just sort of a, a mother nature doing her thing. 
And so I, I've got another question for you, uh, Joe, about, you know, kind of what, what do you have on the horizon? I mean, you know, we're, we're, for the listeners that don't know, you know, we're talking to a guy that's probably got, you know, one of the coolest jobs on the planet. I mean, who else gets to go around and get in the water with animals and interact with animals like that, that most will never uh, get to see. But I, as I was looking up uh, your recent website and preparing for our talk today a little bit, I didn't realize that you're offering to take people on expeditions and things too, to get to experience that, which is really cool that folks get to go out and, and see some of this kind of thing, that, you know, this nature sort of in progress that most people would never get the opportunity. I was hoping maybe you could comment on that a little bit. Well, photographers, filmmakers, we've always kind of like, especially in the beginning of my career, we always kind of like did those sort of expeditions to go out. But I really, I really do honestly enjoy those like, probably a lot of the, the most out of what we do with interacting with sharks because you get to see people see sharks for the first time and that's usually like yeah. life changing for a lot of people which is really cool but those expeditions are really tailored to photographers filmmakers we go to like do tiger sharks great whites <clears throat> I, I i was kind of like uh, i got off subject there maybe i kind of lost it there for a second there but i was like um yeah, running those expeditions have been really fun. I mean, we have a lot of fun bringing people out, seeing them for the first time, seeing how their reactions are to sharks and how how they, like, you know, behave with people. But we also learn a lot because we get to spend a lot of time out there with them. So between my wife's study and running tours, you get to spend a, bu a bunch of time with the animals and you get to see a lot of things most people don't, which is really cool, you know? Yeah. 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 And, and if they don't, you get to bring it into their living rooms with all the great work that you're doing and that sort of thing. So there has been some really cool stuff lately with like that we've been filming on our YouTube channel with like our war fish series. We only did a few of them at first because we were seeing how they were like taking, but uh, we're thinking about running a whole other season of that. But that was like one of the ones that I felt was because we were like running stuff right from, New England and kind of talking about from our point of view of like a day to day, like these are the sort of things that we have to run to every time we go out and do stuff, which most yeah. people don't really get to see and sort of that yeah. same sort of style of like doing shows, but you know, more like the streaming sort of online sort of personality. But there was yeah. some things that we got on there with some camera systems that I, I really feel are going to like end up taking over the whole that's the future, man. Like bringing people yeah. into that stuff. Nowadays, people can film all these events on their own with all these amazing camera systems that you just see stuff. Like we're always sharing stuff back and forth online. I I know. I knew nowadays before, you know, even getting a simple video, you know, in, in these kind of things was difficult. Now it's pretty much, you know, everything almost well, instantaneous from when it's happening. Kind of I've seen long fin makos mm -hmm. and all different, you get, it's like the news. You're sitting there and you're seeing all these little clips come from everywhere where everybody's right. getting it's, all these pieces of information. Some of them yeah, are real, kind of, some of them not, but, yeah. you know. <laughs> but essentially captured in real time, which I guess is, you know, kind of cool. You know, it's the, definitely the way it's going, it seems like. It, it's going to get to a point where this sort of, it, it's amazing how I like, like iconic that animal is. Like you just like this sort of time sort of rolls around the summertime. People start getting in the water. All of a sudden it's like shark yeah. time. I know. Yeah. Well, it, well, that's exactly, you know, at the Institute here, you know, we, we always are program It's a bad rap because it's like, are we the heart research Institute or the shark research Institute? <laughs> and I say, no, 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 we want sharks. We want that popularity because those sharks are such great ambassadors that that's what captures people's attention. And then we can use sharks in that ambassador role to teach people, well, why should they care about marine habitats and ocean currents and all those sorts of things that, that we learn about in marine science? And, you know, the sharks couldn't be a better tool to catch, capture people's attention and that sort of thing. Well, don't the uh, bluefin tuna, don't they, aren't they like babies where you are? Yeah, well, they're right where the oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred as a major spawning act area for bluefin and, tuna and if they're like that yeah. small those sharks wouldn't be paying attention to them but all the other fish would so oh it's like, yeah so those sharks yeah. are kind of policing the bluefin species for up yeah. here what about snapper because yeah. i remember you guys that was super popular down there oh yeah that that was driving the institute's life here in a big way for a while in the fisheries program and they're doing really good they're they're even more robust than when you were here do you and think so believe it or not to do you think the sharks are doing the same sort of thing there, sort of protecting the snapper species yep. and making it healthier? 
same kind, same kind of thing and keeping that intermediate per, predation pressure low with it, that, of exactly what you're saying, predators that we're feeding on them. So, yeah, so we, we, uh, so we tend to tell people, you know, you, you really need to, even though they may get your fish off the line here and there, it's, you know, it's a good, that's a very good problem to have. In terms At of the end of the day, shit. like having population and having like that sort of ability to know that though. But if we were just going to gauge it on everybody's visual things and everything, you would just think all these sharks are just, there's so many sharks and they're just taken over and it's, it's this, but like studies mm -hmm. like yours from the from the Institute show that yeah. sort of stuff with numbers that that's what's really going on. So it's, it's super, super important in that yeah. area to have that yeah. kind of education and know like what's going on there because the Gulf, if you look at it in a temperate year to year, I, I mean, I have this time lapse I show of the water temperature traveling. Uh, it goes like across from Africa, fills up the Gulf where you guys are at. And then it just yeah. all at one pumps out goes around Florida all the way up to New England and back down. Yeah. Like, and it looks like if you go year after year, it looks like a heart. And it's like, yeah. and it's funny that it's the Heart Research Institute because yeah. <laughs> literally the Gulf looks like a pumping heart when you look at the ocean temperatures traveling through it for the whole yeah. Atlantic gyre. So it's well, that's super yeah, interesting. That's really cool. I never really thought about it like that. Yeah, but that's what we call the loop current that comes in and and then, of course, it turns into the Gulf Stream that's driving up to your, in fact, coming more and more near your area and delivering all sorts of sort of semi-tropical and maybe in some cases tropical species. So, yeah, that's all kind of, uh, you know, and by the way, I, we think our sharks ride right along those currents right up to your area as I well. Think it's, so, I think it's a definite, like, I, I, I'll send you the, the actual Gulf Stream current. Maybe you want to show it on the podcast and stuff, the, yeah. the time lapse that I have. Oh, but it, yeah. But it shows it like just pumping like a heart. It's really yeah. actually super interesting because what it happens is all the, the warm water comes up through the Gulf Stream, but when it gets here, it creates all these warm water eddies at the surface. And then we just see tons of endotherms taking advantage of that. Tuna, sharks, all kinds of different things. Like, yeah. And, I, and some sharks that aren't endotherms, like basking sharks, which this year has been a fantastic year for, but we haven't seen a basking shark year like this in over a decade. Really? Yeah. Well, no, that's interesting. Yeah. Huge, huge schools well, of them. Well, speaking of your white sharks, you know, now with all this sophisticated tagging technology that's becoming more and more popular, you know, there's a lot more scientists doing that now than there has been historically. We're starting to see a lot more white sharks come into the Gulf. Now, they might have been doing it all along. We just didn't know it. In Maine but now not, that, yeah. you know, they're carrying around scientific instrumentation for us. We're, we're watching it. So this next year is going to be a big one for us for white sharks in the Gulf. They haven't quite really crossed the Mississippi River, you know, getting into the Western Gulf, but we don't know that. I mean, they might very well be doing it, but at least so far, some of the tag ones haven't. But we'll, we're going to be keeping a close eye on what's going on with that and spinning up some new projects and that sort of thing. So That's, yeah, it's been, that is just something totally new. And I mean, they've definitely seen them there. They've seen them yeah. there throughout this historical evidence and people you talk yeah. to that have seen them back in the day and... <laughs> And they were positively well, we, white sharks. So we always get at least once or you know, every other year we get a grainy picture from a diver. This was historically and it would be kind of like a UFO, you know, it's never in focus, it's never as clear as you yeah, want. They're like, never. This is a white shark, I saw it, I know it was, and we kind of think you can't rule it out, but you never can you know for sure know if it, it is. So probably they've been here, you know, and those were legit pictures that we couldn't, you know, give 100% confirmation ID. But anyway, we'll, we'll be out um, trying to put some tags in them and figuring out what's going on. So it should be a lot of fun. Wouldn't it be really cool to figure out that the, like, once the population starts to become healthier and move around, that these white sharks are just, there's like a normal route they're going through? Yeah. Yeah. And it we, very well could be. So maybe you need to come back to the Gulf, Joe, and we can continue cool. our collaborations. So. Uh, honestly, a lot <laughs> of that stuff, like I've always been surprised about migratory patterns of certain sharks where you see them like yeah. when they first were starting to come around here, I was convinced they were going to the Azores. I was yeah. just like, I was certain of it. I didn't think they were just going yeah. down the coast of Florida. Uh, yeah, I know. Like, they <laughs> just utilize all that coastal species, but they've they've turned out to be a lot more different than people originally thought. Yeah. And I think the same thing with Makos and yeah. everything Same else thing. Right well, now. some of those Makos we tagged on the, the trips with you are literally right in your, they very well could be the ones, you know, the populations you're looking at off of New I England. I think a lot of and them And they come are. back. Do you see and, and juvenile juveniles there? 
No, that's the peculiar thing. We only see adults in pretty large ones, you know, that maybe seven, nine feet is as small as we see. Um, And so we think they're primarily breeding. And then because I know you all see a lot of small ones off of your area. And so, uh, yeah, we're, we're still trying to figure out what's, what's really going on there. What, um, do you think like you get more primarily males or females? Or well, we get both. It seems though um, the er- our early data is showing that the males seem to be the ones that make these long migration patterns, like from the Gulf to your area. In fact, they do it multiple, you know, until the tags die, they're back and forth. That's what we were seeing spending... in tigers too. It's like thousands yeah. for, for tiger males, but hundreds for tiger females. Exactly. It's, like it's pretty much the same pattern or they'll go down deep in the Caribbean. I mean, to but spread genes, back... you would think like the males need to go further to do that. To yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Hyper-figure. And the, the bigger females we've tagged have kind of they moved a lot within the Gulf, but they haven't really left. But we've got a lot more work to do to really definitively answer that. But um, yeah, I would love, anyway, love yes, to come back, do some more stuff on that, especially the white sharks when they start to get more tuned yeah. in on that. But the work yeah. you guys are doing is amazing. Like really, yeah. really just really educational, showing people like the health and what needs to be understood over there. And with the amount of fishing and everything else and the water activities that go up there, it's like imperative to have that sort of like people out there sort of like yeah figuring out what's going on with everything yeah and of course most people don't realize the gulf is sort of the beautiful place it is and we have those kind of things like coral reefs and sharks and healthy oceans and so thanks to you all for showcasing that and actually putting that in imagery that people can see and and witness for themselves and so well joe things the the time always goes fast here is, is you're doing these sort of things and as we're coming up on the end i want to make sure you 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 had anything else you wanted to tell us or, or anything that um, maybe we haven't asked you that we should have? I was going to ask about Lauren and how she was doing. It sounds like she's great with her PhD, and hopefully that's going to mesh well with the all the work that you all are doing in the video space. Yeah, we, we've been doing a lot of work lately as far as her study, but we just had our, our first kid. So, our, like, you know, she's about a year and a half old and she's yeah. just like a handful so we're we're trying to spend as much time as we can with her but we're working on a shark documentary right now that in the next year or so we'll, you, people should start seeing release that's going to be a little bit yeah. different than it's like the one that I've wanted to make for a long time and yeah. we finally got the opportunity to do it so I've been like putting all my time and energy into that but besides that I mean we're online we're on like social media a lot doing a lot of stuff and kind of showing that imagery off and, and trying to get people to support us and push us around and see what, you know, we can come up with. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that's great that you're a point in your career with family, but then you can start picking some of the things you really want to do and that sort of thing. Very so we'll lucky. look forward to, to seeing that. And then, so if I know at joeromero.com is your main webpage, but is there any other social media or anything you want to get out there that you can, um, um, you can find us on have a chance to three 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 productions on like YouTube and, and and usually we we have them on every single social stuff, but on YouTube usually you can find the the whole episodes of Warfish and like see our boat, see our research boat, and what we do out here in New England. So I mean that that kind of follows that sort of stuff. If there was anything I'd really want to promote, it's definitely that. And then also our Monster Mako episodes that you and I did. I know, which, I know. That's great. Which I saw Devin, I spoke to Devin today. He wanted me to say hello to you. Oh, and, good, good. Yeah. I've and, uh, been meaning to reach out to him. Yeah, so. we've had some fond <laughs> memories together. But Devin yeah. and I still do some shark stuff and shark film related stuff. He's been super busy at getting things as well. But yeah, yeah. no, we, we definitely need to get the, the, the band back together and do something. Yeah, new. well, those were a lot of fun times. We'll definitely look forward to that and... Well, Joe, is there anything else that that you want to cover or anything? I think we're just getting close to the end here. It sure was great catching up, and I hope everyone's enjoying all the interesting tales and everything about what it takes to pull off this kind of footage that you collect. If we ever get back to, like, doing another one, then we can definitely tell some show stories. But no, not on the the surface, but we, we, we definitely have more stories to tell at some point. All right. Well, thanks, Joe. We really appreciate you joining us, and I encourage all listeners to tune into all your social media and see all the great work that you're producing. And so, I'll we'll go ahead and stop there. Maybe save some some time uh, to do another one because that was a lot of fun. And uh, for our listeners, of course, we're also present on on uh, social media, and I encourage you all to to do that. Tune into Shark Week this year and and other things to see some of the work that we're doing and and 
we also have a great um, second season of the Gulfstream podcast coming up, coming out. And of course, Joe's just kicking that off and we appreciate that. So Joe, thank you for tuning in and I hope it won't be so long between we, the time we talk again. Yeah, definitely, man. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, consider contributing to a greater gulf by visiting heartresearch.org. That's H-A-R-T-E research.org.